did my first line of cocaine at the age of 22. The best thing you can do is start putting things together around you. There's plenty of things to put together. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Imagine that you have children who have a certain low level amount of neurological trouble when they're infants. So something's gone wrong, maybe a little oxygen deprivation at birth, something like that. Something's gone a little bit wrong with their neurological development. Assuming that the damage isn't too severe, those children will stabilize and normalize if they have at least one well put together role model in their life. One of the things that you do if you want to inspire others is get your act together because you inspire most through example. It's more, much more powerful than, than words. Words are very powerful if they're also accompanied by example. But the best thing you can do is start putting things together around you. There's plenty of things to put together. So I uh, did my first line of cocaine at the age of 22. I had always been a really big drinker and I would binge drink to the point of oblivion. But for me, that first line at 22 changed everything. Uh, at the time I was at a bit of a crossroads. I had just finished university and a long-term boyfriend had broken up with me and I had to decide who I was going to be without the safety net of education and of that relationship. And I just chose really badly. Making the wrong decision starts when making the right decision would have been easy but we didn't think it important. And that sums up my drug taking. By the time I realised just how important it was that I made the right choices, my ability to do so on my own self-will was gone. I was lost. If you're not happy with your life, if you're miserable, you sit on the edge of your bed and you think, is there anything I can change in what I'm doing that is going to make this less awful than it has to be? And you have to ask that, you know, with intent. And generally speaking, you'll get an answer almost immediately. There's something that you could put right that day that would make things slightly better than they are. And that's rule four, which is compare yourself to who you were yet to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. One of my colleagues actually told me that every day he saw me I looked more and more like a crackhead. I went to that group because I thought it would be funny. I thought it would be entertaining. I thought it would be like a really good story to tell at the pub. But actually what I found were a group of people who knew how I felt before I even said anything out loud. They listened to me. They didn't judge me. I was accepted, completely broken. Even in my skewed perception of life as a drug addict, I could see that my life was unmanageable. At the height of my drinking and drug taking, I got floaters in front of my eyes and numbness in my thing fingers and toes, nosebleeds. I was a 23-year-old with extreme memory loss. I didn't wash properly, I didn't open my mail. I also developed a really unattractive facial twitch that would go off at the most inconvenient moments. All in all, I was a complete mess. On the occasional day when I managed to do something for myself, I would maybe have a shower and I'd like moisturize my skin and for that moment, I would feel like I had everything together. Just to something as simple as that, made me feel like everything was going to be okay. There, I don't believe that there's a person who exists who wouldn't receive an answer to that question if they genuinely asked it. And it's no different really than thinking. Like if you think you have a problem, you think you get an answer. Might not be the right answer, but obviously you get an answer. And you might think, well, I thought up that answer. It's like, well, that's really not much of an explanation because you don't know how you think. It's like, I'm sitting there and thoughts appear in my head and that's how I think. It's like, that's a pretty shallow explanation. It's not much different than revelation. It's like you ask yourself the proper questions, you'll get the proper answers. But if you ask the right question and you want the answers, right, and those are not easy preconditions to set up because who knows, you know, if, if you're sitting on the edge of your bed thinking, okay, what am I doing wrong? That's a hell of a question to ask, you know, because if you really want to know, you'll find out. And then you'll find out that you really didn't want to know. Because generally speaking, 
finding out what you're doing wrong is not a pleasant experience and it means that you have to sacrifice part of yourself. Usually a burned out, stupid, bitter, corrupt, arrogant, nasty, vengeful part of yourself, but nonetheless part that you like. The group of people gathered together for a common purpose are more powerful than one person on their own. When you forgive, you set a prisoner free and realize that prisoner was yourself. And that's how I felt. Saying them to someone else makes you realize that it's not that bad, that you're not that bad. And that was such a game changer for me. Anyone in recovery will tell you that there is a magic to sharing honestly. I think that room for those incremental improvements exists within everyone's grasp. And, and I think that it's a humble thing to do, to ask how you could improve incrementally without interfering with anyone else, like it's your problem, not theirs. But I think that the consequences of maintained incremental improvement are anything but incremental. You get compound interest on incremental improvement. You know, there's another rule in the New Testament called the Matthew Principle, it's, economists use it, and the rule is, to those who have everything, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's an, actually a description of the way the world works, interestingly enough. And it's a very harsh rule because it means as you start to wander off the path, let's say, the probability that you will wander further off the path increases non-linearly. And that's a terrible thing to know. As you wander towards the edge, the probability that you'll fall off the cliff increases. And that's a statistical justification for the concept of hell. But as you improve, the probability that each improvement will produce a further improvement increases. The downside is the cataclysmic catastrophe that you can engage upon if you reproduce your moral failings. But the upside is that each improvement produces an increment in the probability of the next improvement. The general consequence of that is that every time they manage an accomplishment, they get a little stronger in character, they get a little bit more confident in their ability, they get a little bit less racked with self-disgust, they get a little bit more hopeful about the future, and they get more confident that they can make another change. And if you're patient, and you have to be patient with yourself that way, it's like you reward those incremental improvements and you don't get all cynical about them, and you think, okay, just imagine what would happen if you kept doing that every week for 10 years. And the answer to that is, things would be so much better for you that you can't even imagine it with that much improvement, or maybe even with half that much improvement. I was selfish. I had put drinking and drugs and numbing out life above all my friends and family. I missed my best friend's dad's funeral because I was too busy getting drunk and high. When I dug even deeper, it became apparent that there was a common denominator underneath all of these character defects, and that was fear. I was making all my decisions based on a fear of being unpopular, of being unliked, of being rejected, a fear of everything. Some people accepted my apologies and were so overwhelmingly gracious, and I just was blown away by their responses. It was spectacular. Other people didn't reply at all, and um, some people just weren't ready to hear from me, and that's fine. It is not about the reactions you get from other people. It's the fact that I was cleaning my side of the street, that I had the humility to make those amends, meant that I was becoming the kind of person that I wanted to be. It's okay if you haven't been able to sort this out on your own. I couldn't either. You know, and no one actually that I know in recovery was able to. We're not built that way. We can't deal with this stuff. It's too big to do it on our own. But there are people up and down the country. There are charities, there are anonymous groups, there are support groups, there are church groups who want to help you. And all you have to do is help yourself. Google them, reach out to them and connect with them and they will support you in that journey. These things may or may not kill you, but they will stop you living. And your life is too important. You are too precious to accept anything other than complete freedom. Xanax is a motherfucker. It, and I didn't know what a motherfucker it was until I talked to a friend who is a counselor at a drug rehab center. We were saying that that is...